Chapter 50 Those Who Face the Future Wearing Masks Twenty one January twenty ten. Minato looked up from his notebook when Hamuko set a cleaning cloth on top of his desk. It's our turn to clean the classroom today, she told him. Right, he sighed as he put his investigation notes away. He paused when the classroom door slid open and Mitsuru came in. Um, this looks important. The twins straightened up as the redhead sternly frowned at them. I'm sorry to ask so suddenly, but... Can you both come with me? She looked around and noticed Junpei was also present. The senior quickly averted her gaze from the cat, Junior. There's... Something we need to discuss. She told the twin leaders. Ah. Uh, Junpei spotted Yukari in the back of the classroom. You want all of us, or just them? Just them for now. Mitsuru frowned. Minato and Hamuko shared a look with each other as they sensed the older girl was hiding something from them. But if she was only going to reveal it to the two of them, she must have had a good reason for it. Hamuko nodded as she put the cleaning supplies away. All right, well, go. Come with me to the student council room. Mitsuru nodded, leading them out. Yukari had been watching for a bit, and she quickly approached Junpei's side. Isn't it? Kinda weird that she'd only want to talk to them. Probably some big, important student council business. Junpei shrugged. Right. Maybe so, but... The brunette knew this senior better than that. Senpai was acting a little weird. She had that look she gets when she's keeping some terrible secret. Oh, you worry too much. Junpei shook his head. Well, if the high muckety mucks don't need us. He smirked as he stood up. Might as well go home. Hey, wait a second, Junpei. Yukari pulled on his jacket. According to the seating chart, if they're not here, you have to clean up for them. The archer smirked at him. Have fun sweeping the hallway. What? Junpei exclaimed. Where did that rule come from? Not wanting to be stuck doing their work for them, he quickly started for the student council room. Mitsuru checked the room once more to make sure nobody would overhear their discussion. There's something you have to know. She began as the twins stared at her curiously. Do you remember the girl named Chidori, who was with Striker? Of course. Minato frowned. How could we forget? Did something happen? Hamuko asked in concern. I don't mean to alarm you, but... The older girl was hesitant, but she shook her head to herself as she decided to continue. The fact is... There's a chance that she may wake up today. Both twins straightened up and stared at each other in confusion. The older brother shook his head. W. -A. I know what you're going to say. Mitsuru carefully calmed him down. And yes, we did see her die in front of our eyes. However, her body began to undergo transmogrification a few days after the incident. For the past few weeks, she has been in the state that is neither living nor dead. Why didn't you tell us? Minato frowned at the senior. Truthfully, the Empress sighed. I was hesitant to bring this up. I thought it would cause undue distress if we didn't know whether she would eventually live or die. How did this happen? Hamuko knit her eyebrows together. I don't know. The senior shook her head. It may be related to her personal abilities, but that's mere speculation. But what I wanted to talk to you about... She held her arm. Is your opinion on how to break the news to Ayuri? The twin size widened. You see, she probably... She was interrupted by a phone call. She quickly answered when she saw it was from the hospital. Mitsuri here. She paused for a moment as the doctor spoke with her. I see. Yes, I understand. She hung up and looked at the two juniors with a troubled expression. That was the hospital. They say she's just awakened. 
It's unbelievable. She shook her head. But although we had confirmed her death, it seems Chidori has come back to life. She paused when she heard the door open behind her. Junpei stared at her in shock. Did I hear that right? I worry. Mitsuru didn't know how to respond to him. Hamuko took a step towards her best friend. Junpei. The cat boy took a step back and shook his head. Shidori is. He slowly found himself beginning to hyperventilate. How? I is this a joke? Some kind of trick? He asked, unable to believe it. After a few seconds of deliberation, Mitsuru decided it was best to tell him. No. It's not a joke or a trick. She is currently recovering in the same hospital as before. Junpei's face slowly lit up. What? Aori. She probably... The boy didn't seem to care about anything else as he looked down the hallway. Shidori. He clenched his fists. Shidori's... Alive? He quickly took off, passing Yukari in the hall. Oh, hey, Junpei. The archer called out to him, thinking he was ditching his job. What about your cleanup duty? She sighed. Jeez. What's gotten into him? Mitsuru chuckled as she stepped out into the hallway. Hamiko, Minato. Well, I guess it's a moot point now. Bart. Perhaps it's best that he found out this way. I think I'll head to the hospital after this, too. Could I ask you to come along? Of course. Hamuko nodded. Minato softly smiled as he played with his headphones. He paused though as he realized a few things. Senpai. There's more, isn't there? Mitsuru frowned as she guessed his concerns. We'll just have to see once we get there. Junpei took a moment to catch his breath as he stood outside the hospital room. He heard rushed footsteps down the hall and lifted his head to see Mitsuru and the twins. The three paused to study him, but the junior noticed Minato and Hamuko giving him encouraging smiles. The tall junior straightened up, grateful that his friends gave him the last push he needed to face Chidori. He slid the door open but immediately tensed up at the sight of the familiar red-haired girl sitting in the hospital bed. Chidori lifted her head up and gazed at him questioningly. She was thinner than before, but other than that, she seemed completely healthy. She kept her gaze steady on Junpei as he and the others entered. Mitsuru looked over to her doctor. How is she? She asked him as she closed the door behind him. Her damaged endocrine system and other internal organs have completely healed. He told her and the twins. She's still weak. But there's no more danger of her dying in two years. Junpei brightened up at the news as he took a hesitant step towards the girl. Is it... really you, Shirori? He began to shake. I'm not dreaming. Am I? The girl knit her eyebrows together. Dreaming. Junpei began to cry in relief and happiness. It's true. It is you, Shirori. He hurried to her side, but paused as the girl continued to stare at him as if he were a stranger. Who are you? She asked him. The tall junior frowned at her. Huh? What? I thought as much. Mitsuri sighed, causing the boy to turn towards her. Transmogrification is a proof that one lacks potential. I suspected that this might be the case. Chidori looked over to the doctor in confusion and the man did his best to explain things to her. This is Mitsuru-san and Junpei-kun. They were your friends last year. Friends? The girl studied the strange students. They seemed familiar, but she couldn't quite remember who they were. My name is Chidori Yashino. She bowed her head to them. I'm sorry. She frowned. It hasn't quite hit me yet. 
but it seems I don't remember any of the past few years. It's as if I was dreaming for a very long time. Shidori. Rashino. Junpei blinked as he never did catch her full name. The doctor flipped through the girl's medical files. It seems all of her memories after she awakened to her persona are gone. She remembers everything that happened before then, but as for you all... He looked up at Junpei sympathetically. The boy lowered his gaze and Mitsuru frowned at him. Ayari. After a while, Junpei looked up at the older girl with a wry smile. Ma. Oh. I think... It's better for her that she doesn't remember all that stuff about fighting and pills when you're having a nightmare. It ain't a bad thing to wake up. I didn't say it was a nightmare. Chidori frowned. Don't put words in my mouth. Junpei looked up at her in surprise. It was a dream of meeting a kind warm person at the end of a long tunnel. The boy's eyes widened. I can't remember it clearly. But I wanted him to be happy, and I... I think... There were flowers. A soft smile appeared on her face. A room filled with them. On. Chidori. Junpei wordly reached for her. Take it easy. You don't have to force yourself to remember. The doctor paused as he considered something. Flowers in a room. If she remembers that part clearly, then maybe... Mitsuru looked at him questioningly. Minato held out his hand to the doctor and was given the files to look over himself. He frowned as he flipped through the various charts. Do you have a theory on what happened, doctor? Do you remember when she'd use her power from time to time to make flowers bloom again? The man asked him. The blue-haired boy nodded without looking up from the doctor's notes. She'd always do it for the flowers in her room on the days when June Pikun would come. Any flowers she touched would be mysteriously preserved. That's why I kept them all, for research purposes. But after the autopsy, I put them all on her chest as a tribute. A smile appeared on the man's face. And thinking back on it, it may have been that night that she began to transmogrify. No way. Hamuko was surprised a persona could have been used to save two lives this way. The power to share one's life with others. Mitsuru smiled. Could it be that she reclaimed the life energy she'd given to those flowers? Well, I can't prove any of it. The doctor shook his head. But compared to how she was before, she's changed. The loss of her power is part of it, but more than that. Excuse me. Shidori frowned at the man. Are you talking about me? We were talking about how you want to live now. The man nodded towards her. How? Oh. The girl stared at him oddly. What do you mean by that? Of course I want to live. I have to find the person in my dream someday. Everyone seemed to have brightened at that. I can't lie in this bed forever. She frowned at the white sheets. Supposing you do find him and meet him. Mitsuru carefully watched Junpei. What then? That. Shidori glared at the nosy senior. That's none of your business. Senpai, what have we said about you not agitating the witness? Minato asked with a chuckle. As if you're not the same way. Hamuko elbowed her brother. But anyway, isn't this great, Junpei? She looked over at her best friend. Junpei. Shidori. Junpei pulls his cap down over his eyes. Two hearts reunited. Mitsuru crossed her arms and smiled at the romantic notion. It's a miracle. She shook her head. No. It's a victory. The tall junior sobbed at that. Shidori. It's she. Shidori frowned at the strange boy. Why are you crying? I can't help it. Junpei shook his head as he refused to let anyone see his face. 
Teach this. This is seriously the happiest moment in my life. Mitsuru chuckled and looked away. Small surprise. She looked over at the twins and noticed them trying their best to not cry. The older girl paused as she heard more sobbing out in the hallway. She opened the door to see Yukari and Fuka crying too. Mitsuru chuckled to herself as she too had tears in her eyes. Twenty-five January 2010 Hamuko smirked as she finished her career counseling. Nisan, sensei says it's your turn next. Minato stood up from his desk with a sigh. All right. He nodded. Just relax. The brunette patted his back. It won't take long. Just be confident in your answers and you'll be fine. Here. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind. Her brother nodded. He paused after stepping out into the hall. What did you decide? He asked his sister. Hamuko wagged a finger at him. This is your decision, remember? You've got to make it yourself, regardless of what I do. She sternly frowned at him. You'd better not keep Miss Torimi waiting. Fine. But I kinda already know what you're doing anyways, Miss Future Doctor. Minato took a deep breath before heading to the faculty office. When he finally arrived, Toriyumi nodded to him in greeting before pulling up his files. Let's begin, shall we? She kindly smiled at her best student. I don't have much to say, though. She shook her head. In the end, it's your decision. All right, first question. Are you planning on going to college after you graduate, or entering the workforce? I think. I want to go to college. Minato stated with a nod. Torimi marked his answer down in his file. I see. Well, if you've given serious thought to your decision, then I believe that is what you should do. She looked towards Minato and saw the usually composed boy didn't seem quite certain about his answer. Is something wrong? The junior frowned to himself and lowered his gaze. After gathering his thoughts, he knit his eyebrows together and shook his head. To be honest, he sighed. I don't actually know what I want to pursue. I know I want to go to college, but as far as what I plan to study, I'm undecided. The woman tried to give him a reassuring smile. Well, you still have another year until you graduate. It's okay if you still haven't decided. Just don't put it off for too long. The boy nodded in understanding. I won't. Now. The teacher sternly looked at him. It's important to keep in mind that this decision is yours, and yours alone. If someone else makes it for you, you'll regret it later. And then you'll have to live with the consequences, whatever they may be. When Otto Riley smirked and nodded to her in understanding as he considered his contract. But, to be honest, I'm quite confident in you. Toriumi proudly told him. You've really matured over this last year. I'm sure you're aware of it as well. She looked down at the papers before her as she asked him another question. What do you think has helped to bring about this change the most? I don't really know. Minato smirked to himself as there was a lot he wanted to say but he couldn't bring himself to do so. A lot has happened this year and I wouldn't know where to begin. But I guess. He lifted his gaze as to stare at his teacher. It's because I was able to meet people. He said with a genuine smile. People who became my invaluable friends. Toriyomi smiled as she sensed the sincerity in his words. I see. Well, whatever the reason. She nodded to Minato. You should be proud of the young man you've become. Thank you, Sensei. The junior blushed. The composition teacher smiled as she knew he'd be fine, no matter what he eventually decided. That's all for now. I hope you have a successful senior year. She put his papers away and checked her class roster. Let's see. Huh. Who's next? Oh, I guess San. Would you mind letting her know? She asked. Not at all. Minato stood up. I'll go get her. Thank you. Toriyumi smiled at him as he left. 
As soon as he was in the hall, Minato noticed his sister waiting for him by the bathrooms. Hamuko smiled at her brother. Sir? I've decided to go to the college. He nervously laughed. Like you and Fuka. That's what you decided yourself, right? Hamuko asked him in concern. Of course. Minato frowned at her. He lowered his gaze and sighed. It's just, I like you and Fuka. I haven't decided what to pursue. He quickly cheered himself up by playing with his headphones. But so long as I have you both at my side, I guess it wouldn't matter in the end. He laughed as his sister smirked at him. By the way, have you seen Igis? Toriyami asked me to look for her. I haven't seen her since classes ended. Hamuko blinked as they returned to their classroom. She slid the classroom door open and looked around for Igis but didn't see her anywhere. Oh. I wonder where she is. Minato stared at the partially empty classroom before a thought occurred to him. When it comes to deciding the future, Igis must be the one having the most difficulty. He sadly smiled. Come on. I think I have an idea where she's gone. Hamuko nodded as she quickly followed him up to the roof. Her brother turned out to be right as they saw the blonde robot staring out over the city. She spotted Igis's troubled expression, prompting her to immediately call out to the android. Ai-chan? Something troubling you? Igis turned towards them in surprise. I'm sorry, I went off on my own. She frowned at them. Minato tilted his head to the side in concern, curious about what was on her mind, but she quickly shook her head at him. It's nothing, really. I just needed some time to think. About the future? Minato asked with a wry smile. She nodded. But not only that. I've been thinking about the past and present as well. A bit surprised at this, the twins walked over to stand at her side. When I finally come down after New Year's, I realized something. When I fought Ryuji, I got really scared when my consciousness began to fade. But that wasn't all. She stared at the siblings with worry blue eyes. I was also confused and embarrassed when I realized I couldn't defeat him. But I couldn't defeat him ten years ago either, and I didn't have those feelings then. I... She lowered her gaze. I really have changed. That's a good thing. Hamuka smiled at her. Ikes nodded and smiled back at the brunette. I've been thinking a lot about this change that's occurred in me. She told them. You know, in the past if I didn't understand something, I would just ask someone to explain it to me. But since I've decided to live... She frowned. No one's been able to answer the questions I have been facing. However... The robot Riley smiled at them. There's one thing I've come to understand. She said, making Minato look up at her in mild surprise. The reason why I wanted to be close to you was so I could monitor death. What? Minato studied her hesitation as she remained silent. What is it? He gently coaxed her to continue. Even though death is gone now, I... I still want to be by your side. I just admitted to them. I still don't know what it means to live yet. She shook her head. But I want to learn the answer. And I think I can, if I'm with you. So, please, please take me with you. The robot's eyes shone in determination. I may not be strong enough, but I'll fight with you to the end. She looked into the eyes. Please. Minato smiled at her and nodded. All right. We'll get there together. The brunette resolutely nodded. Happy by their answers, Igis brightly smiled. Thank you. She strongly nodded and clasped Tomuko's hand gratefully. The blue-haired boy turned around, ready to head back inside. Igis, Miss Turiumi says it's your turn for career counseling. You shouldn't keep her waiting. I understand. The robot nodded to him. Let's go, Hei Chan. Hamuko laughed as she pulled her along behind her.
I see nothing. Then Mother frowned in confusion as she peered into her empty crystal ball. Nothing, Minato exclaimed in alarm. He does that mean I have no future? He asked in slight worry. No. The woman shook her head at him. What I see is nothingness. It is the void. She noticed Minato's confused frown. But do not lose heart. Emptiness is not necessarily the end. The void is infinite, as is the universe. Whether this marks an end to all things or a beginning, it is in your hands. It's like the number zero. Minato stared at his empty palm. After a while, he managed to crack a smile before standing up to bow to the fortune teller. Thank you for your time. You've been a great help. The fortune teller smiled at him as she sensed this was the last time he'd be coming in for a reading. Farewell, then. May your future be bright. Minato nodded before leaving Escapade. So my future is just like me. Anything can happen. He sighed as he recalled the day's date. We have only a week left. Let's make it con. He smirked to himself as he returned to the dorm. Thirty January 2010 The promised day was drawing ever nearer and the twins finally finished their remaining two social links. The first of which belonged to Mitsuru and although she had opened up to the twins, Minato still couldn't help but feel as though the senior purposefully set up a barrier around herself. Hamuko noticed too and with her natural tendency to befriend others and her brother's persistent hellhand tactics, they had completely managed to change the Empress's views on her position as heiress of the Kirijo group. Mitsuru found it difficult to want to take over her father's company and wondered how it was that Hamuko and Minato balanced their sense of responsibility with their own desires. Given their ties to the Kuzunoha clan, she knew they were also shackled by their family but it was always marvelous to see them stretch their binds as thin as they could. It gave the redhead some hope for her own caged life. One day, the twins were unfortunately introduced to her, Fionk, and Mitsuru surprised herself by calling off her engagement when the man insulted her dear friends. The future leader of the Kirijo group had done so without thinking but his words had infuriated her as he looked down on Hamuko's integrity and Minato's honor. Neither twin spoke against him as they knew their place and didn't need to justify themselves to the snobbish man, but Mitsuru felt the need to set things straight. Of course, Mitsuru also needed to apologize to the twins for inconveniencing them. She asked them to join her on the rooftop one day and thanked them for everything they had done for her. She also admitted that out of everything to have happened to the team over the course of the year, she had never expected the twins to have grown into such amazing leaders. Their style of leadership vastly differed from hers, after all. While Mitsuru found it easy to use her chilling authority to get others to do as she willed, the two siblings had a warmth to them that drew others to trust in them. Even if Minato seemed outwardly cold, there was no denying the fiery gaze in his eyes whenever he wished to accomplish a task. That same internal blaze was also in Hamuko as she openly wore her heart on her sleeve. Both twins shone radiantly in the beautifully warm light and it took the student council president a long time to figure out what it was about the two juniors that made them so extraordinary. But it came down to it though, the answer was actually relatively simple. Their strength of character stemmed from their unshakable bonds. Bonza gave them the power to believe and trust in others and in turn have others believe and trust in them. They weren't Navi, idealistic children though. Minata understood the draw of solitude and although she was more outgoing than her brother, Hamuko knew the pain of loneliness. Both juniors didn't seek out others to fill their empty lives. Rather, they sought to expand their horizons by truly making an effort to connect to a world well beyond their own individual limits. As it so happened, their actions also gave Mitsuru the chance to experience the brilliantly expansive universe for herself, forcing her to extend the limits of her own small world. All this was thanks to the twins being able to look at her and see her for who she was as a person, not as an asset. Nothing is harder than facing every single person straight in the eye.
Mitsuru smiled at them in admiration. No one could have served better than you as our leaders. Hamuko blushed at the praise. You're pretty amazing yourself, senpai. The red-haired senior shook her head. Hamuko. You're outwardly adorable. And yet. She studied the brunette. You have a need to be stronger, more courageous, and more charismatic than a man. What does gender have to do with this? Minato crossed his arms and frowned at her. Well, Mitsuru glanced at him in surprise. My apologies, Yuki. The older girl wryly smirked at herself. It seems in the end. It was I who was most hung up on the concept of femininity. Because I am a woman. Despite being a woman, it was just a way to excuse myself for failing. And if I ever needed an excuse to run away, I would justify those feelings by believing my carriage or name was restricting me from all the things I've always wanted to do. Watching you both, I realize. I had been a coward. From now on, I will no longer allow my sex or family name to shackle me. I am me. I have things only I can do. And I will accomplish them. She looked them both in the eyes. I will never ask you both to run away with me ever again, he said. Mitsuru offered her hand out towards them. Stay by my side. Fight alongside me. Live alongside me. Understand? The twins didn't verbally respond as they smacked at her. Mitsuru managed to crack a smile for them before remembering she had something to give them. Oh, I almost forgot. Ew. Minato blinked at the motorcycle key she handed to him. Um. Senpai. Hamuko and I don't have licenses. I know. She chuckled. But I understand you have a penchant for collecting evidence of other people's resolves. This will be proof of my resolve. I'm not going to run from the future anymore. She smiled to herself. There's no need for meat. I don't have to think of my motorcycle as a means to escape from my feelings. I feel bad that I haven't ridden it in such a long time, though. Are you sure you want to give it to us? Hamuko smirked. If you do, you won't be able to ask Akini to accompany you. She teased the other girl. You are indeed relentless. Mitsuru sighed. A blush appeared on her face nevertheless as she turned towards Minato for support. Yuki, tell her I have no interest in Akihiko. I'd be lying if I did. Minato frowned. And I don't lie to my sister. Besides, you're free to do as you wish, senpai. He reminded her. It's not our place to tell you how to live. Hamuko nodded in agreement with her brother. You're Mitsuru Kirijo after all. Student Council President of Gekuken, Captain of the Fencing Team. Leader of the Specialized Extracurricular Execution Squad, head of the Kirijo Group, and our senpai. That's right. Mitsuru smiled. I am Mitsuru Kirijo. She told herself. I hold my head high when I give that name. Thank you, Hamuko, Minato. You have given me pride. When the three returned to the dorm that day, Akihiko was the first out of the rest of the team to sense the change within Mitsuru. The boxer crossed his arms as he sternly frowned at the twins. I heard they ended up ruining your engagement. I know we didn't think much of the guy, but... What about the company? Mitsuru reassuringly smiled at him. The Kirijo group will be fine. I appreciate your concern, Akihiko. As no one else was in the lounge, she kissed the white-haired boy on the cheek before returning to her room. Thank you for all of your support during these past three years. Oh, of course. Akihiko blushed as he watched her go up the stairs. I'll always be here if you need me. He called out to her with a nod. The twins sighed as they understood the seniors were too sensible to pursue a relationship with each other under the current circumstances. Still, it was obvious to everyone that the Empress and Emperor were tightly bound by trust and for now. That was good enough. It was their decision to make in the end and the siblings knew better than to directly interfere. Any further action on their part would complicate things more and life was already difficult enough. 
at least. That was what Iger's learned from spending time with Minato and Hamuko. The robot was doing her best to embrace her humanity, but despite her efforts, she knew there would always be a rift between herself and the twins she would never be able to overcome. They were mortal after all, and Iger's herself could not age or die. Eventually, the twins would leave her alone in the cruel yet beautiful world. When the blonde came to this conclusion, she was filled with a strange mixture of emotions which the twins had come to help her to define as bittersweet. Saddened by such thoughts as they were walking home one day, Hamuko stopped and hugged her left wrist. We're sorry, A.I. Chan. Iga stared at the red-eyed junior in surprise. There's no need for an apology, Hamuko-san. She frowned. That's all a part of what it means to live. She lifted her gaze to study both twins' solemn expressions. To live means to be connected to other people, but life is finite, and farewells are inevitable. It's sad to consider, but you and I must part one day as well. And then, I'll never be able to see you again. Sadness filled her blue eyes. There's so much in life that cannot be understood. It's filled with pain. You meet others, forge relationships, and spend time with them. Then they are gone, leaving you behind. Leaving you alone. That doesn't seem very fair, though. Minato sighed as he reached up for his headphones. No, but that's still how it is. I guess she her head at him before gazing at the shimmering ocean waters. You often watch the sunset from here on Moonlight Bridge, but no two viewings are alike. Life is the same in that no two days are alike. She firmly stated. It is natural for everything to disappear, return and remain in a constant state of change. Life is finite and ephemeral. That is precisely what makes it precious to us, showing us that we shouldn't waste it. It is a miracle for any two like-minded people to meet within the chaotic flux. That's why forging bonds and relationships is a source of happiness. That is the root cause of the joys of being a lie. The blonde robot gently smiled at them. It's not a cold, but a warm kind of sorrow. Shining more brightly as a result of its limits. If I think of it that way, there's no time to falter or hesitate. The twins looked to each other with wry smiles on their faces as what the Igas said was true. Hamuko brought her arm up to wipe away the tears that threatened to spill from her eyes. You're really okay with that, A.I. Chan? The red-eyed girl stared into the robot's blue eyes. Igis frowned. I understand that Minato-san has a fear of losing those dear to him while you fear being left alone. But you don't have to worry, Hamuko-san. There's something only I can say, because I am unable to die. What is it? The brunette asked. I. Igus hesitated a bit as she looked between the twins. We'll never leave you. No matter how or when your life comes to an end. At that moment, I will be at your side. You will. She brought a hand to her red bow, over where her papillon heart was stored. Remain in my heart. Even if we part. You will always be with me. Minato smiled at that. You love us that much, huh? Yes. The robot nodded. Even if you cannot return it, I will always love you both with my entire being. She was surprised when Hamuko suddenly hugged her. The brunette lightly laughed. We love you too, A.I. Chan. She let the robot go and turned towards her brother. Yeah. Minato placed a hand on Igus's head. You're a lot like us. So we won't die on you so easily. Please do the same for us. It's because of you we're still alive. Igus blushed as this was the first time the boy had given her such a kind gesture. The robot felt a strange warmth inside her as Minato fondly smiled at her. I will do my best, Minato-san. She nodded to him. When the boy lifted his hand, she straightened up as she remembered something. Oh, yes. Um. She looked through her school bag for a charge screw. Will you accept this? Hamuko blinked at the burnt lump of metal egg is dropped in her palm. A.I. Chan, what's this? It is. 
The rope but frowned at the bridge they were standing on. One of the parts that had to be replaced after I collapsed. I asked Mitsuru Sen to have it sent to me. I have changed since then. She stared at the twins in determination. I'm not afraid, and I won't give up. I'll get back on my feet as many times as it takes. I'll fight by your side and protect you. This is the proof. I wanted you to hold on to it. Ace. The robot blushed again. A part of me. If to live means to spend time with people you forged relationships with, then I want my relationship with you to be the strongest of all. My connection to you is my reason for living. The thing that's most precious to me is to be at your sides. Both twins nodded to her as they sensed a new persona appear before them, signifying their completion of their final social link. It was hard to believe they had established such powerful bonds with so many people, but they had done it. Their twenty-two social links were proof of how much they had grown. The strength they received had been given to them by their precious friends, and the twins already knew exactly how to utilize the power as they sensed the velvet room calling for them again. Igor looked up at the twins as he awaited their arrival. Ham. The long-nosed man smiled as he sensed the vast potential within them. Stir. Well, well. It seems that you've discovered each of the social links and formed strong bonds with them all. The twins smirked to each other at that. In order to have gotten on so well with so many different people, you must have worn many faces. Perhaps you'll find this useful. Igor waved his hand, and a colorless mask appeared in the air. Since you seem to be able to adopt any sort of face, Cyphers like you too. The mask gently drifted towards them, and they both reached out for it together. Should have this. As soon as they touched it, the mask disappeared, stirring itself away in their sea of souls until the time came for them to use it. Igor studied the two carefully as he sensed they were filled with questions. With it. He told them, "You'll be able to summon those personas." He vaguely stated with a smile, "I'm interested to see what kind of personas result from this. I'll be looking forward to the day they emerge from the seas of your souls." Minato respectfully bowed to the long-nosed man. "Thanks for all your help so far, Igor," he said with a smile. Hamuko nodded to the man. "Yeah." We wouldn't have made it this far without your assistance. You are my guests. Igor bowed his head to them in acknowledgement. Assisting you both is the reason for my existence. I wait your next visit. He waved to them as the twins departed the velvet room. Elizabeth smirked as soon as they were gone. So, they have reached the limit of their growth. I would not say that. Igor shook his head. It is true their powers have peaked, but there is still much room for our guests to further themselves. After all, they have yet to awaken to the true power of the Cipher's Mask. Theodore proudly smiled at his guest prowess. Indeed, they are remarkable guests, Master. If I may. Elizabeth frowned at the soft blue carpet. I would like to test their powers myself. I, too. Long for an answer for the purpose of my existence, and if they are as powerful as we have come to believe, we are not to interfere with our guests' journeys. Igor sternly reminded her. But I am merely suggesting a test of their growth. The golden-eyed girl smirked. A small push is necessary to see the limits of their powers, and no one is more suitable for the task than I. She boasted as she picked up her copy of the Persona Compendium. Do you? She glanced at her brother and noticed him nervously tense up. Don't you wish to see this infinite potential they seem to possess? I cannot say I am not intrigued. The polite young man replied, but I do not wish to cause Hamuko any harm. Very well, I shall face them myself. Elizabeth declared. Yeah. Theodore quickly shook his head as he knew what destruction his sister was quite capable of if left to her own devices. In that case, I shall assist you. He frowned to himself. Please forgive me, Master Minato and Lady Hamuko.
The two siblings looked towards their master expectantly, and Eagle pinched the bridge of his nose. Very well. Fate has brought the guests to the velvet room and assigned you both to attend to them. Keep in mind that the cipher's mask lays dormant within them and their powers have yet to fully settle. I suggest you both be careful, with yourselves and our guests. Very well. Theodore bowed. Oh, I'm trembling in anticipation. Elizabeth eagerly tittered. Hi, how was your day? Fuka smiled at the twins as they returned. We stopped by Shinshadu to pick up the new cannon we ordered. Hamuko smirked. You'll help Nisan install it onto AI Chan later, right? I later. Don't you mean tomorrow? Minato frowned at her as he set the box on the counter. He let out a sigh of relief as all of their errands were complete. Well, with that, I think we're ready for Nix. Fuka, let everyone know to rest up all of tonight and tomorrow. I want us in our best condition. All right. The teal-haired girl smiled at him. But I'm sure we have nothing to worry about. You both have gotten so strong. You shouldn't be saying things like that to Nisan. Hamuko shook her head. He might get a big head again. Not this time. Minato crossed his arms. We can't underestimate Nix. She's supposedly undefeatable after all. He was about to take a seat when his phone rang. The blue-haired boy pulled it out and frowned as it was text. Ah? But we were just there to visit earlier. Hamuko blinked as she also received a message. Is it from them? She asked her brother. Her eyes widened at the contents Theodore sent her. This looks important. She frowned as she looked out the window. But tomorrow is the final fight. Well, they want us to go alone. Minato shrugged. So everyone else can stay put. Fuka studied their serious frowns. Is something wrong? The brunette studied her brother's face and noticed he was on the fence about asking Fuka to go with them. We need her too. She reminded him. Fuka turned to her questioningly and the red-eyed girl put on a wry smile. So I know we said the team's spending tonight resting, but... Minato sighed. Something came up so we're wondering if you wouldn't mind coming to Tartarus with us tonight. It'll just be us three, though. What will you both be doing? Fuka asked. Going through Monad. He simply responded as he stared at the words ultimate opponents on his screen. Something's waiting for us there. Hamuko took a deep breath as she stared up the final staircase leading to their ultimate opponents. She checked her equipment once more before turning to her brother. So what do you think is up there? Minato frowned as he swung his Lucifer's blade a few times. No idea, but if it's stronger than the Reaper, we'd better be prepared. The twins nodded to each other as they ascended to the top floor of Monad. To their surprise, Elizabeth and Theodore were patiently awaiting them. The older sister giggled as the twins approached them. We've been waiting for you. Elizabeth. Minato gulped as he didn't know what to make of the situation. Theo. Hamuko stared at her attendant in confusion. Theodore smirked as he bowed his head to the brunette. You needn't look so perplexed, he told her. You came at our behest to defeat the first we suggested you would find. The adversaries we asked you to defeat are now standing before you. Elizabeth brightly beamed as Minato's blue eyes narrowed on her. Yes. We are referring to ourselves. And here we are. Theodore nodded. I'm sure you understand by now. He said as he noticed the hesitation on Hamuko's face. Can we at least understand why we need to fight you? Hamuko asked them. As I believe I have mentioned before. The white-haired boy frowned. We represent power in its purest form. As such, we may only reach our answers when we encounter one whose power surpasses us. Answers? The red-eyed girl still didn't understand. The truth of our existence. Elizabeth explained as she prepared her persona compendium for battle. 
We have long sought an understanding of who we are. Just as you and my master have done. She nodded to the twins. Those who set foot in the velvet room are all destined to embark on this search for identity. Theodore lifted up his own copy of the Persona Compendium. You may be able to give us the answers we crave. Both velvet room residents stared into the eyes of their respective guests. Will you do me the honor of fighting me? Minato tightened his grip around the hilt of his blade. Yes. He nodded to Elizabeth. The golden-eyed girl smirked at him as she placed her hand on a book's cover. You have my thanks. Hamuko got into a battle stance, pointing the blade of her neck he nodded towards the ground. Of course. She replied to Theodore. Most kind of you. The elevator attendant politely bowed. Nah. The velvet room siblings slipped open their compendiums. Shall we begin? Minato slightly flinched as both adversaries exuded a powerful aura. It was more massive than he had first thought, but he supposed Elizabeth hadn't been exaggerating when she had told him she would be his ultimate opponent. He automatically brought a hand to his headset, a habit he had at the start of every battle. Duke, you getting this? He shakily asked. Who are those two? The navigator asked as she began scanning the strange beings standing before the twins. They're very good friends of ours. What? It would take too long to explain. Hamuko smirked. Aw. Oh, um. Is it just me? Or does it seem like they want to fight? They challenged us and we accepted. Minato told her. Now, what can you tell us about them? Give me a second. Fuka frowned. Her eyes widened as Juno's readings were higher than anything she's ever encountered before. The power of just one of the two beings completely eclipsed that of the Reaper Shadows and Fuka frowned as she knew the twins would have to face both opponents at once. What? Their power is unbelievable. Who are they? Elizabeth eagerly answered the curious navigator. I make my living as an elevator attendant, but I know several effective ways of inflicting pain. I must request that you, spectator of our glorious battle, refrain from interfering from this point on. What? Uh, Fuka shook her head at that. Be but. The consequences shall be dire if you intend to rely on a strength that is not your own. The Velvet Room resident warned the twins and their navigator. Titch. Minato sensed she wasn't kidding as he took off his headset. Sorry, Fook. Hamuko frowned as she did the same. We'll explain everything to you later, Fuka-chan. For now, let us handle this. The twins prepared themselves before Minato quickly made his first move. We'll end this quick. He declared as he slashed his sword towards Elizabeth. Don't worry. The girl said as she accepted his attack. I'm not as fragile as I look. Try to kill me. If you can. A card appeared before her and she crushed it, resulting in Sir appearing. Nisan. Hamuko watched as her brother dodged the powerful persona's flaming sword. Theodore shook his head at the brunette. Pardon me, but I am your opponent. A card appeared before him as he prepared his first attack. I am he who governs power. His gold eyes gleamed. I should pose a challenge, even for you. I advise that you do not hold back. Fight as though you intend to kill. He quickly grabbed the floating persona card and held it up, summoning Uriel. Can you endure this? The brunette jumped back from the flames erupting towards her. When she found an opening, she charged forward and slashed at Theodore with her weapon. He didn't seem too bothered by her attack though as he summoned Gabriel. Nearby, she could hear Jack Frost's laughter as Elizabeth used the persona to attempt to freeze her brother in place. The twins hectically dodged a cycle of elemental spells until they were backed against each other. So what should we do? Hamuko nervously smirked. Counter whenever you can and don't drop your guard. Minato cried out, slightly out of breath from all of his evading. 
It looks like they're both open now, though. Beast us out, will you? Mind charge. Hamako quickly call for hello. Lucifer. The blue-haired boy cast Mejidali on, but it didn't seem to deter either of the Velvet Room residents. Gritting his teeth together, he pushed Hamuko away from him as Elizabeth charged at him for a slash attack. Minato quickly brought his sword up to parry her blow. Theodore mercilessly called out another persona. Beelzebub. Masakado. Elizabeth cheerfully shouted aloud. Predicting their next attack, Hamuko quickly brought her evoker up to her head and fired. Ishnu. Minato did the same thing to prepare for the onslaught of Mejidalion spells. Anade. Fusion spell, Infinity. They sighed in relief as the Invincible Barrier took four consecutive blasts of their opponent's most powerful spell. Minato quickly took advantage of the brief recess and drew a beat towards his sister before using one himself. Magnificent! Elizabeth remarked as Minato countered another of her attacks. Your power is every bit as impressive as I'd hoped. But, the curtain has just risen. Show me your best performance. Minato rolled out of the way of Thor's Mazarin. If that's what you want, then take this. Lucifer's blade glowed as he brought it down against his opponent. Elizabeth worked as she blocked his strike with her persona compendium. Hamukro evaded Theodore's high kick and slashed at his suit with her Velval Muruga. Come on, Theo. I can do this all night. She boldly bluffed. The white-haired boy chuckled at her words as he took a moment to recover from her attack. The story has reached its climax. He straightened himself out and smiled at her. I regret that this moment must end. He called for Raphael's power and cast Ma Garadine. Hamuko winced as the gales hit her, but she did her best to shake it off. Mind charging again, Minato. Metatron. Elizabeth cast Mahaman and watched as a swordsman faced it head on. Minato sighed in relief as a homunculus took the mortal blow for him. Mejidolion. He scowled as once again the elevator attendants brushed the spell aside. The junior quickly lifted up his blade as Elizabeth rushed towards him to strike him. Marvelous. Elizabeth took a step back as the boy pulled off another successful counter. You wielded such power. She smirked as she prepared another attack. The performance is on the way. We should give you something to remember. Minato flinched back as Alice appeared to cast Mammy June. There! Elizabeth called out for her brother to end things with another onslaught of their most powerful almighty spell. Your fate is in the cards. Elizabeth smiled as Masakoto appeared behind her. My apologies for this. Theodore respectfully bowed his head to the twins. The bright explosion blinded Hamuko and she felt the blast throw her brother into her. The brunette weakly pushed Minato off of her and tried to get up but found it difficult to move. Her limbs were heavy and she didn't know whether it was because of the pain or exhaustion. Tea thank goodness for enduring soul. She wryly smirked. Why yeah? The blue-haired junior got to his hands and knees as he coughed his lungs out. Tea damn. You okay? Hamuko shook her head at him as she helped pick him up. I think. We're at our limit. She lifted her gaze and noticed the attendants approaching them to signify the end of the battle. The brunette let out a shaky laugh as she elbowed her brother. Oh, let's do that. He looked back at her with the same crazy smirk she wore and nodded. The red-eyed girl took in a deep breath before using the last of her strength to lift her evoker up to her head. Satan. Hello. Minato clenched his eyes shut as he pulled his trigger to... Fusion spell, Armageddon. They desperately called out. The four fighters fell to the ground but after a few minutes of letting the results of the battle sink in, the twins finally found enough strength to get back up. Hamuko smiled as she limped towards Theodore, offering out her hand to her loyal attendant. That was some battle. Let's not do that again, Theo. The brunette said with a laugh. Minato nodded in agreement as he pulled Elizabeth up. 
You really were the ultimate opponent. He winced as his entire body screamed in pain. And I think I'm going to remember your parting gift for a long time. He groaned as he wanted to collapse. Elizabeth lowered her gaze and frowned to herself. The blue-haired boy looked at her in concern. Is something wrong? We. Oui. The gold-eyed girl looked between the powerful twins. We believed that we would find our answers when we challenged one who was stronger than us. Or so we had long thought. Theodore sighed. But despite our loss, I hear no faint epiphany whispered in my ear. And I have received no such revelation. Elizabeth nodded. She paused before staring up at Minato in confusion. Wait. I am mistaken. Theodore frowned before looking up at Hamuko. What is this emotion that wells up within me? He chuckled at his guest. It's as if the core of my being is filled with satisfaction. Could this be my answer? He asked the brunette. The twins looked to each other with a shrug. Minato crossed his arms as he studied at the two velvet room attendants. And what answers have you found? Elizabeth smiled at him. The answer is this. Only I can decide who I am. Theodore nodded in agreement. Only I can answer the question of my true self. He wore a worried frown. Is this, then, the first step towards finding that answer? I'm sure it is. Hamuko nodded to him. The golden-eyed siblings looked to each other in mild surprise before smiling at their guests. Elizabeth nodded approvingly at the power Minato displayed. Now, I believe congratulations are in order. You have overcome the most difficult obstacle we placed in your path. Yes, well done. Theodore Warmy took Hamuko's hand. You are indeed wonderful guests. We will dole out your reward in the usual fashion. He paused as he opened up his purse on the compendium. Oh, and... Please take this. It's not a reward. Only... A sign of my gratitude. Hamuko accepted the fragrant bookmark with a soft smile. Thanks, dear. Elizabeth did the same for Minato as she pulled out a platinum bookmark from her persona compendium. Thank you for the wonderful time. She told her blue-haired guests. Now, please make your way to the entrance. I have some thinking to do. I shall see you again in the velvet room. Theodore bowed to his red-eyed guest. Well then, may we meet again in that room. Mind how you go on the way back. The twins smiled at their attendants before returning to the lobby of Tartarus. When they were gone, Theodore quickly turned to face his sister. Their powers have indeed grown, but it seems as though the cipher's mask within them isn't complete. This must be the girl our master was referring to. Elizabeth frowned. No matter. She shrugged. I'm sure they will uncover its power on their own. I wonder. Whose face will the mask reflect? When they finally got back to the dorm, Minato placed a hand over his stomach and frowned. I'm a bit hungry. Do either of you want anything before turning in for the night? Vicar Riley smiled. Sure. Do you need help? I think I've got it, Fuka. He nodded. Hamuko, you in? Thanks, but I'm going to bed. The brunette yawned. Good night. She smiled at the couple. Don't stay up too late now. She winked at her brother. Very funny. Minato plainly stared at her before heading towards the kitchen. He gently smiled at his girlfriend. Just give me a moment to whip something up. All right. The teal-haired girl nodded as she sat at the counter to watch him work. She wasn't quite paying attention, though, as she thought back to their previous battle. I was completely useless. She sadly thought to herself. A shiver ran down her spine as she remembered the powerful beings the twins faced. And even if I had done anything to help. That Elizabeth woman would have just summoned Pixie to heal herself and attack them.
Being forced out of this battle reminded Fuka of the limits of her abilities as well as raised important questions about the upcoming final battle. If the opponents tonight were this powerful, how would Nyx compare? What if Nyx somehow jammed her connection to the team? Would she be able to continue to support Caesar before? Battle analysis was her sole responsibility then if she couldn't do that, then what good was she? They didn't even need me tonight. Fuka frowned to herself. I want to fight too, but wouldn't I only get in the way tomorrow? While everyone else climbs Taurus, I'll be the only person waiting at the bottom. She glanced up towards Minotaur and noticed his back was turned towards her as he quickly whisked three eggs in a bowl with a pair of chopsticks. He seemed completely fixated on his task and Fuka continued to stare at his back in admiration. All I ever do is watch him from behind. I don't think I'll ever be able to stand by him like the others. But what I want most is to always be at his side. Minato felt her gaze and cast a glance over his shoulder, smirking at her. He blinked though as she didn't seem to notice. She blankly stared through him and the blue-haired boy turned back towards the stove carefully drizzling the beaten eggs over the beef and onions. Fook. He called out to her. Are you all right? The girl quickly sat up, surprised by his question. Why, yes. I'm fine. She tried to smile at him as he scooped out two bowls of rice for them. Minato sternly studied her expression and the girl faltered a bit. She lowered her gaze in shame for lying to him. And no. The blue-haired boy carefully plated the beef bowl and set it before her before taking a seat at her side. I'm here if you need me. He reminded her as he held out a pair of chopsticks to her. She accepted them from him and nodded her head in understand. I, I know, Minato-kun, but I'll be fine. Minato tilted his head to the side as he continued to stare at her in concern but he didn't press her. Knowing he was waiting for her to start eating first, she quickly picked up her bowl. Anyway, let's eat. Itadakimasu. They ate in silence, but while that wasn't uncommon for the two of them, Fuka noticed the boy was eating at a much slower pace than usual. The girl sighed and put her chopsticks down as she realized he was probably thinking about how best to speak to her without upsetting her. To save him the trouble, she turned toward him and decided to just tell him. Minato-kun. He blinked at her in surprise but patiently nodded. Yes, Fuka. During the battle tonight, what were your thoughts when I was asked to not interfere? Minato frowned to himself. I was a bit apprehensive at first, but then I remembered you were still watching me. I know I don't ever want to fail if you're watching. But I don't want to just watch you fight. Fuka frowned at him. I want to protect you too. She shivered as she remembered how she had been forced to do nothing. That was probably the most terrified I had ever been. She softly muttered. You and Hamiko-chan were in terrible danger yet I couldn't do a single thing. What if that happens tomorrow? It won't. Minato shook his head. The entire team will be together tomorrow and I know you'll protect us. I can. You can. He firmly stated. You are our navigator and I believe in you. If we get into a bind, you also have Oracle and escape route. I don't know if I'll be of any help tomorrow. Fuka shook her head. Oracle is only usable once a day and there's a chance it will backfire. It would be too risky to rely on it against Nyx. And since you're all going to be climbing to the top of Tartarus to face Nyx, there should be no reason for me to use escape route to bring you back. She clenched her fists. The only thing I can do will be to support you all from Tartarus's lobby while you'll all be fighting at its peak. And if something happened where I couldn't contact you. She faltered. The distance between us is just too great. Minato pensively studied her pained frown. Then come with us. He simply suggested. The teal-haired girl looked at him in surprise. What? Climb Tartarus with us, he stated with a nod. 
If you're concerned with being left behind, then come after us with your earned strength. He stared into her brown eyes. The strength I know you have. I'd only get in the way of your battles. Fuka shook her head. If I'm there, they aren't be too distracted trying to protect me to fully utilize your abilities. She found it a bit difficult, but she managed to break away from his intense gaze. I can't risk being a burden to you. Especially tomorrow. Minato lowered his head until his bangs fell over his eyes. But I want you there at my side. He quietly told her, making her pause. After a few seconds of silence, Minato slowly reached up for his headphones. Buka, do you know what's the most important thing I'll be fighting for tomorrow? She shook her head before nervously looking up to him. I intend to fight to preserve the bonds I've developed this year. Bonds? Minato nodded before explaining it to her. When I first moved here, I didn't expect to meet so many people. Even more surprising was the fact that I was able to get close to anyone at all. A small frown appeared on his face. I'm not that strong of a person to actively reach out to others. I've always believed that I was best off on my own, but when I gained the power to summon Orpheus, I had been told that my powers would be developed alongside my emotional ties to others. Initially, I didn't understand because it just sounded as though I was just using others as a means to make myself stronger. Minato slowly lifted his gaze and stared at Fruka. But then I met someone I genuinely became interested in. Really? The girl curiously looked up at him. The blue-haired boy nodded in response. Who was it? Um. The boy averted his gaze. It's kind of an embarrassing story considering it took me a while to get this person's name. I kept forgetting to ask even though I had been given multiple opportunities to do so. He smiled to himself. But I guess it didn't really matter because even though I didn't know who they were, I loved talking with them. His blue eyes shone in happiness as he spoke. I didn't have to worry about using this person because they went a social link. This person was also the first friend I actively reached out to of my own accord. His smile slowly faded as he let out a heavy sigh. So imagine my surprise when I thought I killed her after she disappeared into Tartarus for ten days. Fuka's eyes widened. Wait. You're talking about... Minato shook his head and let out a light laugh. Of course I'm talking about you. You were the first person I actively managed to befriend with my own strength. A serious expression washed over his face. Even more, you're the first person to wholly accept me. He gingerly reached a hand towards her locket and opened it. Even when I did finally begin my social link with you, I wasn't worried because I knew our friendship was real. For it to develop into something more. Well. He softly smiled at the small picture stored in the charm. Let's just say that the bond between us is my most precious out of all of the ones I've formed this year. He gently snapped the locket shut and stared into the girl's brown eyes. That's why. I want you to be there at my side tomorrow. The two of us are always connected and it's thanks to you and Juno that I know I'm truly connected to everyone else too. The steel-haired navigator lost herself in his warm blue eyes. The way they glowed reflected his resolute belief in her, and Fuka knew she couldn't deny his earnest request. All right, Minato-kun. She nodded. I'll do my best as always tomorrow, but this time, I'll be right at your side. And if you're in danger, it'll be just like when we were on Moonlight Bridge against Strega. Minato reassured her. I won't let you get in harm's way. Well... If Lucia can handle a barrage of offices via spells like during the fight against the Lover's Shadow, Fuka considered, I'm sure Juno's barrier is a lot more powerful. Wait. That happened while I was charmed? Minato frowned. Why you weren't hurt, were you? No, but you were. She reminded him. You burned yourself. Oh yeah. He scowled at the memory. Can we not bring that operation up ever again? I hate the lover's shadow so, so much. But we're lovers now. Fuka giggled. 
You've been spending too much time with my sister, haven't you? Minato chuckled as he turned back towards his late night dinner. Well, because it's you, I don't mind. So long as I get to be spoiled by you, I won't ever mind. He watched as she picked up her chopsticks again and resumed eating. Hey, Doka. She looked up at him. Will you please stay with me tonight? Of course. She blushed. Minato Kun. The boy nodded to her. Thank you. For always giving me courage. I love you. Her face burned up even more and she looked away from him out of embarrassment. I harbor of courage. Minato didn't say anything but Fuka could feel him smiling at her. He didn't need words to tell her how he felt because everything she needed to know were written in his glowing blue eyes. Just his presence alone was enough to bring her comfort. He held an important place in her heart and Fuka knew that no matter how many masks he'd wear, he would always still be the same Minato she loved. Nothing would ever change that. Still, she had to pause as Juno felt something inside the boy resonating. As quickly as it appeared though, the strange signal disappeared. The teal-haired girl smiled to herself as she sensed that whatever power it was, it would probably manifest itself tomorrow. Until then, she would faithfully be at Minato's side, ready to support him as they fought for their future. The entire dome made their way to Naganaki Shrine and quickly dispersed throughout the park. Although they were all high school students, with the exception of Ken and Koromaru, they found themselves playing on the jungle gym and slide. I guess smiled as she played with Koromaru. Um, she told the dog. Koromaru barked before holding out his paw to her. Um, paw is the command given to ask the dog to put his paw out. Then, Koromaru barked and nodded. I see. The robot stated in fascination. Yukari blinked at Mitsuru as they both sat at the top of the jungle gym. Huh? Clothes shopping. With me? The older girl quickly shushed the archer. Not so loud. Ugh. That sounds great. Yukari smiled. Let's go together next time, Mitsuru-senpai. Within the jungle gym. Fuka friend as she got herself stuck inside the maze-like structure. Yunpei smirked as he tried to give her directions on how to get out. Go right, Fuka. One around the right. Okay. Ah. Uh. Fuka frowned as she noticed she was going in circles. That's left. The cat boy blinked a few times. Oh, I meant my right. He frowned as an idea came to him. Um. Why don't you just climb the jungle gym? Hamuko laughed as she stood at her best friend's side. Because Minato got stuck trying to rescue her. She pointed at the tango of mist dangling upside down of Bafuka. I told you not to panic, Nissan. The brunette continued to snicker. SH shut up. Minato glared at her. Do you need help, Minato-kun? Fuka asked with a small smile. The blue-haired boy felt his face go red. Why, yes. Fuka tried to reach up for him to pull him down, but they flinched as Hamuko captured the picture of the moment, blinding him with a flash. My eyes. Minato yelped as he toppled to the ground. Minato-kun. Fuka worriedly knelt at his side. That's a keeper. Hamuko smirked as she took another photo. Wait. Wait. Dude, take it easy. You just almost killed your brother. Junpei frowned at her. By the slide, Ken adamantly shook his head at what Akihiko was daring him to do. What? The young child frowned. I'm not going to go down the slide head first. My clothes will get all dirty. Akihiko crossed his arms. When I was your age, we used to have competitions to see who could slide down in the funniest way. Like how? Ken asked. His brown eyes widened as the older boy began undressing. And no, Akihiko-san, please don't take your shirt off. Ken flinched as another flash of light illuminated the playground. Another keeper. Hamuko smirked. 
I wonder how much I can sell it for at school. I'm sure your fan club will pay good money for a shot like this, Akini. Akihiko's face went red. Hey, give me that camera. The boxer quickly went after the tricky brunette. I swear, if you break my camera, Hamuko, I'm murdering Pyro Shinji. Minato roared from his confines. He smiled though, as everyone seemed to be enjoying themselves. The promised day was near, and they wanted to make the most out their remaining time together. End of chapter.